I'm Xingxing. I am an assistant professor of interaction and media design at Parsons. I'm Catherine Moriwaki, associate professor of media design at Parsons. Hello, everyone. My name is Shirley Lund. I am a creative technologist, a multidisciplinary artist, and some of you may know me as a part-time faculty at Parsons, and I teach CC Lab. So I want to spend the day to talk about a project that I'm working on called Alternative Futures, Protect Me From What I Want. And Protect Me From What I Want is a little ode to Jenny Hosier. So this project is actually something I started last year and it began with a quintessential question about this deep humanistic desire to better understand and predict and in many ways control our own future. And it led me down this path of investigating the powers of control and the relationship between intergenerational Asian American issues and machine learning, specifically with a focus in ideas around social mobility, social class and wealth transfer. So before I begin, I want to start off with a little thought experiment called the veil of ignorance. Um, the veil of ignorance has been a political philosophy um, exercise has been around for a very long time, but it was popularized by John Rawls in his book, A Theory of Justice in 1971. And the basic premise is, imagine you're in charge of designing a world. If you don't know where you're going to end up on the social spectrum, uh, you don't know your identity, you don't know your race, your gender, your position in the society, how would you design something to ensure equality in equal distribution of resources? And I think about this experiment a lot since I've heard about it. And as I'm thinking about this thought experiment, I'm simultaneously thinking about the complex systems in which we currently exist in. Where we live in a world where social inequality and racial and gender inequality and wealth gap is ever so present and relevant in everything that we do. And it led me to question my decision-making and how much one can have when making a decision. So I like to think about this through the metaphor of a decision tree. When a tree grows, it grows upwards with multiple branches going in multiple different directions. And imagine each branch as a decision node in life. This branch, and this node will affect each resulting branch after that. And each previous decision also affects the next. So I wanted to take a step back and think about how we construct this tree. In essence, how far back do you have to go in order to reconstruct this kind of present and eventual future? And can I create something that's very different and perhaps better than this current life that I'm currently making? So I believe that understanding the relationship between prediction, decision-making during key branching moments can help us better understand our present and in many ways can aid our decisions about the future. Because when we tend to make decisions, we make it in the present based off of this vision of the future that we want to live in. So in order to sort of uh, dive a little deeper into this metaphor, before we think about the future, we kind of have to think about the past. And following the tree metaphor, I'm talking about the visible growth of the tree, but I'm not really talking about the foundation or the invisible roots. And roots are the foundation of a tree's livelihood. Because of the roots, the tree has branches. And likewise, because of my foundation or a foundation, I have a life and I have decisions that I am making. And when it comes to going back to in relation to today's class, and readings, when it comes to intergenerational wealth transfer, social mobility, the stronger foundation you have, the more opportunities you have to grow this prosperous tree. And the idea of wealth and privilege is exponential. It's not linear. Um, just like this idea of like compounding interest rates and with multiple generations of exponential growth, all of a sudden you have this population where income, race, class, gender, social privilege is vastly unequal and growing further and further apart. So in thinking in this paradigm, I'm also simultaneously thinking about my own narrative. 
as an Asian American woman growing up in the US, I'm constantly confronting my own identity and dealing with this idea of belonging and disbelonging. I was born in the US and growing up here, this idea of freedom and choice and decision was kind of drilled into this idea of being American, the American dream. But at the same time, my parents were not born here, they immigrated here. And as a child of immigrants, I'm not necessarily coming in with the same foundation as someone who has laid their roots here for multiple generations. And to some extent, a different set of values were kind of instilled in me. And choices and decisions are heavily influenced by the physical and literal movement and migration of our ancestors. Whether or not certain choices were made before my generation affects my current opportunities and decisions. And coincidentally, as I'm exploring this kind of dynamic and relationship, I also realize that there exists a similar relationship between our ancestors influencing our current decisions and technology also influencing our current decisions. So this led me to investigate this intersection of intergenerational Asian American issues and machine learning. And before I dive in, I, I wanna talk a little bit about machine learning and um, what is machine learning? So according to Wikipedia, the definition of machine learning is a study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. Machine learning algorithms build uh, a mathematical model based on sample data known as training data. And in order to make predictions or decisions, it's doing it without being explicitly programmed to do so. So hmm, I thought this is interesting. And how can I use this as a way to control my own future? And the specific model that I'm exploring is called GPT-2. It was created by a organization called OpenAI. And this image is actually a sample of the model at work. It is trained by millions of data points, texts from the internet, text script from uh, Reddit. And basically it's kind of like a metaphor for different elements of society coming together. And I became fascinated with trying to A, understand this model, but also investigating it in as what can I, what can this model do for me in terms of being able to use it as a tool to create generative futures and to explore my own narrative? So if I tell my model my story or someone else's story, what is it going to create? What is it going to generate? And this GIF is actually an image of the model at work. So a person or a bot is feeding this model some sentences and it's just generating additional sentences on top of this original phrase as an additive to the narrative. So in order to dive into this investigation, I decided to investigate and examine the life narrative of three people, myself included. And I picked the other two people because they are also Asian American women and we share similar identities, backgrounds and made similar decisions in life. And at the surface, we are seemingly interchangeable, but we're actually on very different life paths and our lives have taken us in very different directions. And I was curious to see how our decisions drove us down these different paths. So I gathered the life story data from the interview, just asking a bunch of questions and collecting the data as text data, and then trained the algorithm GPT-2 and generated versions of our alternative future. And I generated a lot of these futures, over 2000, I believe, and some of them are legible, some of them are very bizarre, some of them hit very close to home, and some of them are super surreal. And at the same time, they're like understandable texts that tell us the story. So I went through these narratives and I took a healthy sampling and I did some text analysis to kind of figure out what are some of the most common words. Um, life is one of them, happiness. And then, then I hand selected a selection of these narratives and created a physical installation consisting of a wall piece of these generative features printed out. And as I was doing this, I was thinking there's a better way to sort of visualize this. So I decided to look into 
virtual reality as a vehicle to actually dive into these narratives a little bit more. And I picked virtual reality because it's important to me that these narratives feel lifelike and real. Like they are the retelling of someone's story and it's an experience kind of like peering into someone's mind or gazing into someone's stream of consciousness. Someone who is not necessarily myself, but could be myself in a parallel universe version of myself. And the way that I intended it to be built was a physical installation and an immersive experience. There will be three long scrolls of generative alternative realities from the three personas that will undulate from the ceiling. And one of these scrolls will feed into a black box with the VR headset inside. And the viewers can interact with this by putting on the headset to see the audiovisual experience of the narratives of some of these alternative futures. So the project is called Alternative Realities, Protect Me From What I Want. And it started out as a way to better understand my life and how it turned into this ongoing conversation between the artist, me, and participants that explores generative narratives of race, identity, and privilege in the Asian American community. This project interrogates our relationship with technology by using computer prediction as an extension to control our own future. While we tend to make decisions based off of this vision of our own future, the more I think about it, so much of our choices are already constrained by society. And so much of what is in GPT-2 is also constrained by society. So how much of this is truly generative? And also how much of this is truly free will? So to answer my own question, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that there is something to be said about the powers of control in this case, technology, but also the influences of intergenerational decision making that subsequently affects multiple generations later on. The aesthetic choice of immersive VR storytelling combined with the video transitions transports the viewer into another dimension through glimpses of a infinity mirror room filled with lights that metaphorically represent the endless possibilities of the multiverse. The design of this experience is ethereal as well as eerie with which mirrors the feelings of uncertainty between the powers of control between the artist, technology, and society. So I picked the three narrative to visualize this in a 360 video experience of the audiovisual experience. And because this is meant to be in 3D, I'm actually going to show a 2D screen recording of the narratives. So I've been thinking a lot about this and I've always been curious about this idea of happiness. How would you want to become happy? How would you achieve happiness? So I've always been curious about this idea of happiness. I think that it can be a sign of weakness to have a zipper on, but I think also a sign of strength. I think a zipper on is a bad sign. I think a bad sign is, it would be nice to be able to wear glasses and things that show emotion in, but I think that emotion can be a vehicle to allow you to be who you are and show emotion in a way that, I don't think we can see that in a world where humans are supposed to be, you know, very persistent, very outgoing. And I think that, I also think that, you know, this is a Western idea of happiness and it's always been a Western idea of happiness. And in many ways, Asian American there, middle class to lower middle class. I think that there's more to it than ethnicity. I think that there's a lot to it I'm thinking about. It actually does make. What am I doing now? I'm not living out my fullest potential as an artist or even a person who is, you know, powerful, but I'm also probably not going to be making a lot of money. I don't think that I have a solid sum of all of my assets and I don't think that I have a set goal. I think that I've always wondered what would have been had. I, I don't know if I've figured it out. I, I don't know. It kind of comes to me when I'm trying to think about, you know, what I want. I want to party. I want to hang out with my friends and I want to do whatever I want. And I don't know if I necessarily want to live another person's life. I think that I, I don't know. If this person's not worth remembering, 
I'm not going to make a lot of money. But I mean, I think about money. I think about it when I sleep. I think about it when I wake up. I think about it there in the beginning of my day in the afternoon. I, I mean a part of me likes the fact that I've always been curious about this idea of karma. How would you want this place to work? So I first of all, I think I'm very happy in my body. I'm very happy being a man. I'm very happy being a woman. I'm very happy being Asian, but at the same time, like I just wonder, I wonder how different and how much better my life would be. And also I like, I wonder how different and how much better my life would be if my parents were not first generation Asian American or like did not move here from China and raise me in a city where they speak to very little other language. And I mean, even till this day is not, is not as assimilated as I am. I wonder how different my life would be if they were able to kind of not rely on me to in some ways take care of the American burden when I was a child and figure out how to be American on my own. So I don't know if I necessarily want to live another person's life, but I would have liked to add some more privilege to my own life. I think, I think it would. So you can check out more information about this project on my website. And this project began as an attempt to control my own future using technology, but it turned into this speculative, existential, and critical piece about the pervasive powers, but also the limitations of technology. And this merely begins the conversation with the viewers and takes them on the same journey that I ventured through to discover this rich foundation of unearthed narratives. And it has enabled me to engage my own personal narrative as well as narratives of other members of the Asian American community. And within this community, there's so much more complexity when it comes to this identity under the umbrella of Asian American. Like the experiences I have as a Chinese American woman is very different from someone who is, I don't know, Vietnamese American or Cambodian American or someone who wasn't born here or came here as a child or as an adult. And I'm interested in continuing this conversation with the Asian American communities across the US and to better understand the anxieties of the futures that we envision for ourselves here. Thank you. So thank you for your presentation, Shirley. We really appreciate it and it's uh, extremely fascinating. The text you chose is much more explicit in terms of identity and complexity within the Asian American community. You know, the whole monologue actually really delves into the kind of privileges, yet at the same time um, intersecting oppressions that uh, come with a, a particular or maybe even a, a kind of hybrid of all of these different stories combined, right? So I think that it was actually very compelling in terms of, as shall we say, calling attention to how someone's life could be very different depending on uh, small factors that might actually redirect, uh, you know, an, an individual's um, life path. Yeah, I I really like the text too, and I I actually when it started, I thought that it was more surreal and closer to um, the, the experience that I've had with other kinds of text generated um, sort of language. Mm -hmm. but, but it started anchoring down after a while. And I think that was really powerful for me um, because there is a kind of, like when you encounter like generated text spoken through a robot voice, there's always this tension of like artificiality versus, you know, like taking the, 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 the text in as, as if it's natural, you know? And, and I, think, I think there's like a really interesting parallel between that sort of tension of artificiality versus the kind of like question, questioning like the, the experience of being an Asian American and that, that internal state whether whether it's authentic or not <laughs> you know like even from your own perspective versus from other people viewing you you know and i think there's something really interesting 
about that parallel of like, you know, questioning whether this feeling is surreal or constructed or, um, you know, does it belong here, that feeling? And I, I think that's, yeah, that was really um, nice. And for me, like a refreshing way of using like that, that format like of generated text. You know, one of the things that I also appreciated about the work and about the specific uh, set of, of text that you were choosing to highlight in this presentation is that it's very contemporary concern amongst the Asian American community. And really, uh, in light of, you know, current events, in light of uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, thinking about how, as a community, Asian Americans have been both complicit in upholding whiteness and upholding the status quo, yet at the same time also simultaneously experiencing um, degrees of discrimination and exclusion from, you know, this so-called kind of American ideal, right? So the fact that you can simultaneously, on one hand, have Asians throughout the country experience uh, moments of harassment and taunting from the, you know, quote unquote, you know, Chinese virus, right? Uh, yet at the same time, also, uh, you know, align with whiteness, uh, I, I think in the most shocking instance where you had to Tao, who was standing right by as, uh, as George Floyd was being murdered. So I think that there is really this moment of reckoning within the Asian American community of, well, what does this mean? And what kind of, what kind of place are we really making for ourselves uh, in this country? Yeah, it's very interesting you brought that up because when I began this project and when I started doing the interviews with myself included and also the two other Asian American women that I incorporated into my work, this was pre, this is pre-COVID. It was in 2019. All of the data that I've gathered um, a lot on the narratives of what life was pre-COVID in a way. And in many ways, it pre-COVID just wasn't really a place where a lot of Asian Americans, at least within my circle of community, where we confronted our, our complicitness in what was going on within racial tensions in the US. And in addition to that, since this project has been done, GPT-3 came out. And GPT-2 is now like an old, outdated model. And GPT-3, is like an upgraded version of um, the old natural language processing model. And I'm just curious, like what kind of text is being used to train it? Is there any new text? Like what is going on in the internet community specifically around um, Black Lives Matter and everything that's going on that can affect this natural language processing algorithm? So I'd be curious to see what, how different it would work, especially with like new narratives and new data and different models and kind of see how this is kind of how societal influence is going to influence some of the generative narratives. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, do you consider the GPT-2 or 3 training data as part of the work? Do you, do you uh, want to suggest the viewers consider that? That's a good question. I think that um, I think that intention originally when I started this process, I very much thought that this was part of the work because it's more of a participatory um, exercise with different members of the community. And I think that moving forward from like a practice standpoint, I very much consider like this participation part as part of the work itself. Um, I do think though that there is like a separate component to some of the um, the intentions in hand selecting some of the specific narratives and also the creation of this through through what is essentially my lens. Um, so I think that there is a lot of different components into play and this is a very large project with um, different parts that's interlinked, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting um, to think about that. I guess um, I'm thinking about like the, the formation of a 
of one's like interior space. And that's like a lot of what I was thinking about when I was watching the video, like that sense of interiority and the language to describe or express that interiority and how that's always sort of like, you know, responding or accumulated through the external world. <laughs> and, and I'm just like thinking about how, yeah, like what you're describing, like, like what would the differences of, um, you know, text generation be um, for, for if, if the, the language or where we're coming from, like, let's say a, a, cons a conservative city in the United States versus a liberal city, and how does that parallel to um, the, the Asian American experience? How, how do you kind of nudge the, the outcome? Like, what did you have to do to kind of nudge the outcome to make it more um, reflective of the current moment? I, um, actually, I, I didn't nudge the outcome. I just, um, selected programmatically, like, more pointed narratives. Like, these were part of the 2000 that I generated, and I, at one point, I read through all of them. I think what I did was I kind of just reran the model a couple more times, so I had more, um, options to look at and perhaps maybe I don't really know what goes into like GPT-2 maybe the model was being updated with everything that was going on at the moment and it just had um, more of a influence in sort of shifting the direction of some of the narratives um, and I, I had a suspicion but I wasn't entirely sure um, yeah I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about machine learning is that the public impression is that the machine takes over and does everything autonomously. It's in charge, you know, it's sentient and, and able to make these decisions. But the reality of what happens is that there is still a high degree of human intervention in the process. And so I think that this question about, you know, what, um, what you're doing and what the algorithm is doing is actually really key because it highlights that, that, that degree of influence that humans actually do have on the process at every stage. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is um, also an element of like uh, training the data with specifically the transcript from the interview that influences the output of the algorithm. And it's not I think what I was highlighting at from the beginning is that it's not machine learning can be like conceptually thought as as a black box, but there's just so many different points of human intervention that comes in and even in the creation of the model like it itself is not like we don't really know what goes in, but there's definitely huge human intervention that goes in into creating all of this and then also there's human intervention from my side. And the project itself is a lot of human intervention in like selecting these narratives. Um, and the way that I chose to sort of like show it. Yeah, I, I'm also curious about what you said relating to wanting to learn more about the Asian American experience across the states. Um, do you have any idea for like the future of this project or what's the next step for you? Oh yeah, good question. Um, I think that to like really dive into this a little further and engage in conversation with, with the Asian American community and really be able to gather more data, hear about more stories and try to see what direction this project can take me.